Okay, uh, I'm Xia Hua Jia uh, from Computer Science Department at the City University. Uh, dear distinguished guests, professors, and students, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's first keynote speaker, Professor John Hopcroft. Um, Professor Hopcroft is the IBM Professor of Engineering and Applied Mathematics in Computer Science at Cornell University. After receiving both his MS and PhD in EE from Stanford, he spent three years on the faculty of Princeton. He joined the Cornell faculty in 1967 was named professor in 72, and uh, Joseph Ford Professor of Computer Science in 85. He served as chairman of the Department of Computer Science from 87 to 92. His research centers on theoretical aspects of computing, especially analysis of algorithms automata theory, and uh, graph algorithms. He has authored four books on formal languages and algorithms with Jeffrey Woman and Alfred Aho, both are Turing Award winners. His most recent work is on the study of information capture and access. Professor Hopcroft was honored with the Turing Award in 1986. He's a member of National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, a foreign member of Chinese Academy of Sciences, and a fellow of American Academy of Arts and Sciences, fellow of IEEE and ACM. In 1992, Professor Hopcroft was appointed by President Bush to the National Science Board, which oversees NSF. From 95 to 98, he served on the National Research Council's Commission on Physical Sciences, Mathematics, and Applications. Without further ado, let's welcome Professor Hopcroft to give us the keynote speech. Hi, Professor Hopcroft. Yes, we can see your screen. The size of data has become enormous. Uh, one needs significant mathematical tools to process and abstract information from big data collections. We're living in an information revolution in which processing uh, large, larger and larger data sets will become common. As the size of the data sets increases, more subtle information can be extracted. To process these large data sets successfully uh, requires a significant mathematical uh, background. In this talk, I will illustrate the depth of material and the need to improve undergraduate education to provide companies the talent they need to flourish. When I was an undergraduate student, graphs could be drawn on a piece of paper and maybe had 10 or so vertices. In the 70s, graphs had grown in size to a few thousand vertices. Today, they have 10 to the 100 vertices. The number of atoms in the visible universe uh, is only 10 to the 70th. So how, how do you store in a computer a graph that has more vertices than the number of atoms in the visible universe? Uh, you don't. <laughs> uh, it's, it's obviously impossible. Uh, 
But one can explore a graph without storing it in the computer. Uh, consider doing a random walk on a graph. All that is needed is an algorithm that when presented with a vertex, gives the set of adjacent vertices. You select an adjacent vertex, move to it, and discard uh, the previous uh, vertex. One only saves the vertex that the walk is, is currently at. And this, this is just one example of how data, too big to store in a computer, uh, is, is processed. Many problems uh, with big data uh, involve uh, random walks on graphs. One such problem involves computing the expected value of a function defined on 10 to the 100 values. The set of input values is so large that one cannot compute the sum directly. So one samples. But samples are not equally likely. So one must sample according to the probability distribution of, of the samples. To do this, one creates a graph with a vertex for each element of the input set. The graph is designed so that the stationary distribution of a random walk assigns to each vertex the probability of the corresponding element. One can select an element by doing a random walk until the stationary probability is achieved and selecting the element corresponding to the vertex the walk is, is at. Uh, if the time of the random walk to converge to the stationary probability is proportional to a power of the number of vertices, uh, the walk will never reach uh, stationary probability. Uh, so, so there, there is a, a problem. An important intellectual concept is that of an expander graph, in which the time for a random walk to converge to stationary probability is a function of the logarithm of the number of vertices, rather than a polynomial in the number of vertices. By making sure the graph is an expander, the time to achieve the stationary probability is, log is the logarithm of the number of vertices rather than a polynomial in the number of vertices. So an expander is an important concept in analyzing big data. Data has become so large that one does not store entire data sets but randomly samples the data. This and many other operations requires randomness. We need to understand randomness and the concept of the amount of randomness needed in, in a much deeper way. Let's begin with the concepts of expectation and variance. The expectation of a sum of random variables equals the sum of the expectations of the random variables. And th this is true uh, even if the random variables are not statistically independent. However, the expectation of the product of random variables requires statistical independence for the expectation of the product to equal the product of the expectation of the two random variables. We shall see that because of this, two-way independence uh, is, is important. The variance of the sum of random variables requires independence for the variance of the sum to equal the sum of the variances. To simplify the understanding of why independence is required, assume that the expected values of the random variables are zero. Uh, th this is not essential, but it simplifies our understanding. For zero expected value random variables, 
The formula on the slide illustrates that the variance of the sum of random variables equals the sum of the variance of, of each random variable provided that the expected value of the product of two random variables is equal to the product of their expected values. Since in our example, the random variables are pairwise independent, the expected value of the product of two random variables equals the product of their expected values. Since we assumed that the expected value of each random variable was zero, the expected value of the su summation of the product of random variables in the formula uh, disappears and the variance of the sum equals the sum of the variances. Uh, this uh, indicates why for the variance of the sum to equal the sum of the variances does not require full independence, only two-way independence. Uh, suppose you want uh, uh, a computer algorithm to generate an infinite random sequence of zeros and ones. If a random sequence is one in which there is no short description, then you cannot create such an algorithm uh, since the algorithm uh, would be a short description of the sequence. So instead of generating a truly random sequence, one generates a pseudo random sequence. If you want to randomize a set of elements by a hash function, you cannot fully randomize the set. So you pseudo randomize the set. And uh, by uh, pseudo-random, we mean make the set of elements appear random, but not fully random. This raises the question of how much randomness is actually needed. If told to select a random integer in the range 0 to 10, and you select 5, What's random about the integer 5? Well, there, there's nothing random about the actual integer 5. What is random is the way in which 5 was selected. Thus, when we say select a random sequence or integer, there is nothing random about the actual item selected. What is random is the manner in which it was selected. Why are we interested in the way an item is selected? Usually, we're going to insert the selected item into an approximation algorithm. And we want the approximation to be close to the true answer uh, with high probability. Uh, the distribution of the approximation is governed by the distribution from which the random element inserted into the algorithm uh, was chosen. Consider a, a, a sequence in zeros and ones of length 10 to the 100. Clearly, the, the sequence is too long to store in a computer. But for an algorithm to use the sequence, one only needs a short description of the sequence and a subroutine that given the short seek description and an integer i provides the ith element of, of the sequence. Uh, there are two to the 10 to the 100, zero and one sequences of lengths 10 to the 100. If we assign names to the sequences, we need two to the 10 to the 100 names and the names must be of length equal to the logarithm of 2 to the 10 to the 100, or 10 to the 100 symbols long. And thus, there are no short names. If we want to select a fully random sequence of length 10 to the 100, we need to select from the full set of sequences. However, 
If we do not need full randomness, we can select from a smaller subset of maybe only a thousand of the sequences. We refer to the selected sequences as pseudo-random. If we use the small subset of a thousand sequences, then short names are possible. Use the integers from one to a thousand uh, for names. So selecting from the small subset gives us a sequence that looks random, but is only pseudo-random. And we need to determine how much randomness is actually needed. If we only need each bit in the sequence to be equally likely as zero or one, we only need a subset containing two sequences. One of the sequences is all zeros and the other is all ones. And whichever sequence, if you e select between these two sequences equally likely, then uh, each bit will be equally likely to be a zero or one. However, if you select one of the sequences from the subset with just two sequences, and you tell me the ith bit of the sequence, you've actually told me the sequence, and hence you've told me the jth bit. Uh, maybe uh, you would like the ith and jth bits to be statistically independent for all pairs i and j, but you do not need triple sets of bits to be fully independent. Telling you the value of two bits might determine the value of a third bit. Uh, consider the following set of four sequences of length three. The four sequences are two-way independent, since in telling you any bit in a sequence does not change the probability of any other bit in the sequence. To have full randomness, you would need to select a sequence from the full set of eight sequences of length three. The reason we may be happy with just enough randomness to have two-way independence is that when we have a random approximation algorithm, we would like the expected value of the answer to be the true answer and the variance uh, to be small so that the actual answer would be close to the true answer with high probability. To determine the variance of a sum of random variables, we would like the variance of the sum to be the sum of the variances of the individual random variables. Th this, this will be true uh, if the variables uh, are stati statistically independent. However, we do not need full independence of the variables, only pairwise independence. Uh, assume one owns thousands of stores located throughout the world and would like to know the number of customers. When a customer makes a purchase, a record is received which includes a credit card number, a WeChat account number, or some other information of the customer. One could keep a list of distinct customers and when a customer ID is received, compare the ID with every ID on the list, and if it's not found, add it to the list. This method is extremely slow and not possible if there are billions of transactions. There are many other methods, but I would like to illustrate a very efficient algorithm, which gives a very good approximate answer to the question, how many distinct customers are there in the set of stores? Uh, let M, uh, let M be the number of potential IDs and let D be the actual number of customers. The expected distance between the IDs is M over D plus one. The expected value of the smallest ID is M over D plus one. And on the slide, I let MIN 
be the smallest ID received. And solving the equation, min equals m over d plus one, gives d equal m over min, min minus one. Thus, we only need to keep track of the smallest ID to get an estimate of the number of customers. Uh, how, how, how accurate is this estimate? The argument assumed that the IDs received were random. However, that may not be, be true, resulting in a misleading estimate. The solution is to randomize the IDs. Then with high probability, the minimum ID will be between M over 6D and 6m over d, giving a good estimate of d. Uh, establishing uh, the lower bound on the probability is small, that the probability is small does not require that our randomization of IDs is pairwise independent. However, establishing that the upper bound is small requires calculating a variance and hence requires that the randomness is two-way independent. Uh, recall that two-way independence means the value of one element gives no information about any other element. Uh, analysis of almost every approximation algorithm shows that two-way independence is the most randomness that is necessary. Uh, However, the next problem requires more randomness since it's going to involve the variance of a variance. Suppose you have access to every IP address and wish to know if some IP address is sending an unusually large number of emails. To do this, we need to calculate the variance of a billion quantities corresponding to a billion IP addresses. For each IP address, you can determine the number of emails that the IP address is sending, which I've denoted by, uh, on the slide by F sub S. Uh, the second moment of the string of emails is the sum of the squares of the number of emails each IP address is sending. At first, you might think all one needs to do is create a counter for each IP address and determine the number of emails sent by each IP address. Square the number of emails sent by each IP address and add them up. But unfortunately, uh, there are billions of IP addresses, and you cannot create billions of counters. So could we do this with fewer counters? To get a good approximation requires only one counter. Uh, to approximate the second moment, ind independently set a random variable to plus or minus one with probability a half for each IP address. Maintain a sum by adding the random variable associated with an IP address to the single counter each time the IP address sends an email. This results in a sum equal to the sum over all IP addresses of the random variable of an IP address times the number of, of emails the IP address sends. The expected value of the sum is zero, since the expected value of each of the random variables is zero. However, the actual sum is a random variable and takes on various values. The expected value of the square is the sum of the squares of the number of emails each IP address sends, provided the random variables are at least pairwise independent. 
Thus, the expected value of the sum is an unbiased estimate of the sum of squares of the number of emails each IP address sends. But how good is the estimate? Thus, we want to know the variance of the estimate. Provided the random variables are pseudo-random with four-way independence, the variance will be small. The reason four-way independence is required in this case is because we're interested in the variance of a variance. It's, it's, it's rare uh, when a random algorithm needs more than two-way independence. Another important task with high dimensional data is to find the closest neighbor. There are numerous problems that require this, such as an algorithm to locate the nearest taxi. A way to speed up such algorithms is to map the high dimensional data to a lower dimensional space. Uh, the johnson lindenstrass lemma establishes that when you map high dimensional data to a lower dimensional space, all of the distances shrink by essentially the same amount. And running the nearest neighbor algorithm in the lower dimensional space speeds up the algorithm. If, if you map a billion dimensional space to a thousand dimensional space, the algorithm will run a million times faster. Uh, clearly, we want programmers to be aware of this. Our intuition about space was formed in two and three dimensions. Higher dimensional space is fundamentally different. It's important to understand high dimensional space. Uh, what, what is the volume of a unit radius sphere in high dimensions? As the dimension goes to infinity, the volume of a unit radius sphere goes to zero. Thus, if one generates high dimensional Gaussian data, it will lie on an annulus and there will be no data uh, near the origin. Uh, since there's no space near the origin. Uh, in two dimensions, the majority of the data lies near the origin, where the maximum density of the Gaussian is. In high dimensions, uh, if the Gaussian is unit variant, the majority of the data lies on a sphere of radius square root of the dimension. Another important concept uh, for high dimensional data is the singular value decomposition. The rows of a matrix span a vector space and the singular value decomposition finds a special basis where the vector basis vectors are called right singular vectors. An important property of the right singular vectors is that the first singular vector captures the maximum of the vector space. The second singular vector captures the next biggest component of the vector space, etc. Any vector in the space spanned by the rows of the matrix can be expressed as a linear combination of the singular vectors. If you multiply the matrix by a random vector x, each component of the random vector is multiplied by the corresponding eigenvalue. If one repeatedly multiplies the random vector by the matrix and normalizes the result, one gets the first singular vector. Uh, to see this, if the second singular value is less than the first singular value, the ratio of the second singular value to the first singular value is less than one. And for large k, the ratio goes to zero, and one gets a constant times the first singular vector, uh, which is normalized to the first singular vector. 
uh, th this method of calculating the first singular vector is called the, the power method. An application of the singular value decomposition is ranking the results that a search engine like Google returns to a query. Search engines represent the World Wide Web by a graph where each web page is a vertex and there's an edge from vertex A to vertex B if the web page A has a link to web page B. A search engine converts each web page to a vector using the word vector model and finds those pages whose content is close to the search query. Then it ranks this set of pages by their importance in the web. An important page should have many links from other pages and thus a high probability in the stationary distribution of a random walk on the graph of the World Wide Web. It turns out that the stationary distribution is equivalent to the first singular vector of the matrix corresponding to the World Wide Web. Thus, the value of pages is obtained by using the power method to determine the first singular vector. At this point, I trust I have illustrated uh, the mathematical sophistication necessary to effectively handle big data. In order to produce the talent essential for companies to successfully process big data, we need to improve undergraduate education. Uh, th there are many other areas such as AI, cryptography, security, quantum communication, that also requires sophisticated theory. To handle all these areas will require improved ed education. Uh, Ravi Kanan, Avram Blum, and I have documented much of this material in a book, and we negotiated an agreement with the publisher that we could give a digital copy of the book away free to anyone who wants it. It can be accessed from my homepage website. Uh, it's used at a number of universities at the sophomore and junior level. It's important that students master this material early in their university education so that they can use it as they take more sophisticated courses. Uh, we're, we're living in, an, in a new age where sophisticated ability is essential for individuals. Uh, in the past, it was gold, agriculture, or oil that made nations great. Uh, in the future, it will be talent. Thus, it's essential to focus on improving education. I will spend a few minutes discussing a project the Minister of Education in China uh, created to improve computer science education at the top 33 universities in China. Uh, the project has become known as Project 101. And the Minister of Education designated PKU's president, Hao Ping, uh, to be in charge of it. And Hao Ping has uh, assigned individuals to execute the plan. If it's successful, it will be extended to other domains and other institutions. It's a very ambitious and important project. It consists of two major components. The first is to determine the key courses in computer science and develop the content and teaching material for them. This component will actually improve computer science education at all 1,500 universities in China. The second component uh, is to improve the quality of teaching. 
Uh, the first component of the project, for the first component, the 33 universities selected 12 key courses in computer science. Each course was assigned to one of the universities to develop the content for the course. The individual at the university responsible for developing the course content for an assigned course formed a team of the top 10 faculty in the area of the course to work on developing the content and teaching material. Uh, the second component of the project focuses on helping faculty improve teaching. Uh, the, the methodology uh, grew out of a project to evaluate teaching in which a faculty member sat in on a lecture and observed the interaction of the faculty member teaching the course with the students in the course. When evaluating teaching, one learns information that can help the professor teaching the course improve his teaching. And this, this is key. Let me illustrate by telling you what I learned in evaluating one class. Uh, the faculty member was an outstanding young faculty member and was teaching 30 students. But when she started, every student was engaged and listening carefully. About 30 minutes into the lecture, half of the students uh, disengaged, and I wondered why. The faculty member had just put up a mathematical theorem and then spent 20 minutes proving the theorem. I talked to the faculty member after the lecture and told her what had happened. We discussed it for a while and concluded that maybe the students did not understand what the mathematical theorem said, and it might have been better if she had explained the theorem intuitively, why it was important and how it would be used. Uh, she could have then engaged the class uh, in converting the intuitive form of the theorem to the mathematical theorem. Also, uh, we discussed if it made sense to spend 20 minutes proving the theorem. Maybe just discuss the key steps that would be needed. This led to a discussion what we would like students to remember about the lecture six months from now. It is not uh, the detailed formal proof. Based on uh, this experience, Project 101 is having faculty sit in on lectures and discuss how students interact with what their teachers are teaching. The assumption is that the resulting discussion will lead to improved teaching. Having talked about improving university education, I'd like to bring up the issue of how to hire an outstanding faculty member. Many uh, university science and engineering departments are hiring research researchers for faculty. This uh, raises the question, if the mission of the university is to educate, why do departments in science and engineering focus on hiring researchers? Uh, the, actual, the answer is actually very simple. When a university hires a new faculty member, they are hiring someone for a career of 40 or so years. They want someone who will grow with their field and 30 years from now will not be teaching material that is 30 years old. They want someone who, because they are curious, will observe how the world is changing 
and how that should change education. Thus, they are looking for two aspects of a potential faculty member. Is he curious? And does he appear to have lasting energy? If the potential faculty member is curious and a new direction appears in his field, he's likely to explore it and update his course. This will keep the faculty member teaching material that's new and up to date. Uh, unfortunately, uh, many recruiting committees look at the candidate's research and ask how fundamental is it? And they look, look at how important the journals are that he publishes in. They should instead be asking, why did he pick the topics he has worked on and how curious is he? Will he continue to explore as he gets older? Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about AI and begin with a brief history of the beginning of AI. McCullough and Pitts developed the Threshold Logic Unit in 1943 for a model of neural nets in the brain. However, they did not train the Threshold Logic Unit. In 1960, Frank Rosenblatt at Cornell University trained the weights. When I got my PhD, only single gates were being trained. We lacked computing power to uh, consider networks of threshold logic units. We lacked large collections of data. The NIST data set of handwritten integers did not exist. I considered building a data set of handwritten integers, but there was no technology available to scan the integers. I'm going to just check and see if I have a couple more slides. No, I've, I've lost. Uh, Well, I'm, I'm going to just cover the rest uh, without my slides. Um, an important question in AI is why a network trained on one set of data works on a different set of data. Uh, this is called generalization. And there exists an important theory explaining when it will work and when it won't. It's important for universities uh, to cover uh, this this theory. Generalization works in areas other than learning. One such area is sampling a data set to get good approximate answers to questions. How large a sample set does one need in order to get good approximate answers? The same theory that explains generalization in learning answers the size of the sample needed with large data sets. A single threshold logic unit will only handle linearly separable data. If data is not linearly separable, then map it to a higher dimension where it is linearly separable. The concept of a kernel explains how this is done without actually mapping the data to a higher dimension. Although a threshold logic unit can only separate data that is linearly separable, if the data is not linearly separable, it can be mapped to a higher dimension where it is linearly separable. If a threshold logic unit is trained by the standard algorithm, the weight vector will be a linear combination of the patterns. And this allows you to train the threshold logic unit in the higher dimensional space where the data is linearly separable without actually knowing the mapping 
but only the product of mapped images. The product are called uh, the products are called a kernel, and this led to the support vector machine, which was the key to AI applications uh, before deep learning. Uh, deep learning came from an in ImageNet competition. Prior to 2012, the, comp uh, is, is the 2012 competition, the error rate of the winner was 25%. In 2012, AlexNet reduced the error rate to 15%. Such an improvement led researchers to apply the technology in many areas with significant successes. In 2015, ResNet reduced the error rate to 3.6%. Uh, humans with training error, with training, have an error rate of about 5%. Uh, ResNet had, had a thousand levels, and this raised the issue of how to train such a deep network. In training, this appeared to require taking the derivative of an error function with a thousand levels. Uh, the way this was done was using a training method similar uh, to stochastic gradient uh, descent. And so this, this is why understanding the basic uh, technology is so important in undergraduate education so that people will know how to do these things. Uh, but AI uh, has been applied successfully in applications, including medicine, business, agriculture, finance, and many other areas. Some areas where AI is playing uh, a key role are optical uh, character recognition, uh, handwriting recognition, search recognition, and voice recognition. Uh, deep learning uh, in in pattern recognition in high dimension. Deep learning is pattern recognition in high dimensional space. It has been very successful in applications in image classification and speech. However, uh, deep deep learning is only one tool in the AI toolbox. So let me talk a little bit about future directions of AI. In the future. Researchers will need to understand the function of an object, how to learn from a single image, and how to continue learning. Uh, consider self-driving cars. It's impossible to program every situation a self-driving car might encounter. Thus, it is important that an AI system in the car learns to improve its driving just as a human does. Uh, also, uh, we should talk about many, many of the issues that are going to come up. Uh, let me start, first of all, social issues. AI is going to change the world in a fundamental way. A smaller fraction of the population will produce all the goods and services we need. There will be little or no uh, physical work, and goods will automatically be delivered to our residences. AI will change many other aspects of our lives, and the application of AI will cause a number of social issues to arise. Uh, for example, why did the AI system make a specific decision? If an algorithm is used to make hiring decisions, individuals might want to know why they were not hired. If an algorithm is used to grade exams in university courses, Students might want to know why they did not get a higher score. If the algorithm is a black box with just an input and output, no such information is available. And we need to find a way that AI decisions can be understood. There's also the issue of bias. Data used for training AIs an AI system may be biased. The AI network will reflect those biases, 
And if currently most high-level positions are hired by are held by men, AI programs may give men preference in selecting individuals for higher positions. And similarly, uh, Asian culture is different from U.S. culture. Thus, a system trained in China may not give good solutions in the U.S. There's the question of the distribution of wealth. AI will modify work environments. Many low-level jobs will be automated and disappear. The process will generate significant wealth. But who will get this wealth? The creator of the algorithm? Or the individuals who lose their jobs? A good distribution of wealth will be essential for the stability and future growth of a nation. Uh, this is an important issue to understand and resolve. There's also the question, as jobs disappear, individuals will be concerned about their future. If individuals do not understand what their future will be, they will become nervous and could create a serious domestic stability issue. It's important that we educate individuals about the nature of their future lives. There's also the question of social interaction. If large numbers of people are unemployed, how do we engage them in meaningful activities? How will people behave when their interactions are with computers rather than with people? And, and who, who is responsible if an algorithm makes a mistake? The issue obviously comes up with self-driving cars but uh, will also arise in many other domains. When a self-driving car injures someone, who, who is responsible? Is it the owner, the manufacturer, or the designer of the self-driving car? AI brings up issues that will require us to modify legal systems. Then there's the question of unintended consequences. What if we ask an AI system to eliminate uh, the coronavirus? Uh, an individual would suggest creating a vaccine or isolating individuals. But the AI system might respond by saying, eliminate all humans. Uh, if there is a major street where many people are killed by jaywalking, and we ask individuals to solve the problem, they will fence the sidewalk so pedestrians cannot jaywalk. If we ask an AI system for a solution, it might suggest removing the street. Uh, AI, AI systems will play an important role in the future and be the main contributor to the gross national product. Talent will be important for the development of these systems. Regions that develop talent will attract companies that will grow the region's gross national product. Developing talent will require improving undergraduate university education. This will require changing the metrics by which universities are evaluated. It's not the amount of research funding a university attracts or the number of papers published, but the quality of the undergraduate education. AI will create many social issues and resolving the issues that will arise will require quality university educational programs. Uh, and this means that quality education in science and engineering needs to include humanities and social sciences. An important uh, issue when concerned with improving the quality of education is educating the general population through the importance of education. When communicating a message, it is important to understand who the audience is and what you want them to remember. A scientific researcher talking to other researchers working in the same problem area can use technical words and give theorems and proofs. A scientific researcher talking to a general scientific audience should instead explain intuitively what he has done, why it is important, and how it will impact the field. A 
but an individual speaking to the general population needs to confront another issue, which I'm going to illustrate by a short story. I became aware of the impact of the first three years of a child's life on their future life and looked at research on the issue. Today, there is scientific research on how the brain develops and on the impact of the intellectual environment of the child's first three years. In the first three years of a child's life, the brain learns how to learn. Experiments 30 or 40 years ago helped mothers provide a stable and intellectually rich environment for the first three years of their child's life. And then 30 years later, compared the child with others who had not been given such an environment. Uh, the results were impressive. There were fewer mental issues, higher educational levels, higher salaries, and other significant benefits. The first three years of a child's life is so critical that I wanted to educate and build support for funding a program so every child would have a stable and intellectually rich environment for their first three years. But this would require educating the general population about the importance of the first three years. When engaged in developing a plan to educate the general population, I discovered that a writer for a major magazine only received six or $8,000 for an article. I realized I could afford to hire 10 high quality writers, but there was a problem. How do I identify quality writers in the childcare area? So I contacted uh, the individual who selected writers for a major magazine, told him what I wanted to do, and asked for his help in identifying writers. And this is when I learned a major communication issue. His response was, uh, John, that's a dumb idea. He got my attention and I asked him to tell me more. What he told me was that half of the US population never reads an article in any of the magazines I was talking about. He said I needed instead to develop a digital channel and communicate that way. I thought about it and quickly realized that that was not going to work either. The general population already have acquired their beliefs on issues and they are hard to change. What I should focus on instead is improving elementary school education. Uh, before moving on, uh, I should tell you about a conversation with a researcher who is focused on understanding what made an environment intellectually rich. I mentioned it must be hard to do research if you need to wait 30 years to see the results of an experiment. She said that is not what she did, does. She told me that the brain of a mouse develops similarly to the brain of a human. So she uses mice as a proxy for humans. She purchases 200 mice, puts 100 in ordinary cases, and the other 100 in cases with an intellectually rich environment for mice, and keeps them there for three weeks. Then she puts all 200 mice together for two years and then tests them on mazes and other tasks. The 100 mice that were in the intellectually rich environment clearly outperformed the other mice. I, I then asked her, what's an intellectually rich environment for a mouse? Uh, she emailed me a photo where each item was labeled with a note telling me what part of the brain it developed. I mentioned this experiment since it's an experiment anyone can repeat and is very compelling. Uh, let me talk about a, another issue. Uh, suppose we want to educate the general population about global warming. 
Well, the way to do it is to go back to elementary school education and consider teaching global warming to second graders. Uh, you have a global of the world, okay, and you tell them it rotates. And for the portion facing the sun, it is daytime, and for the other portion, uh, it is night. You mentioned that we can see the moon since some of the light from the sun reflects off the moon. Then you mentioned that when the sun shines on the portion of the earth that is day, some of the sun's energy is conserved and some is reflected. If the ratio of the energy that is conserved changes, it will have an impact on the earth's environment. And at the present time, the ratio of absorbed energy is increasing, and that is called global warming or climate change. Then, then what you do in subsequent years, in the third grade, fourth grade, fifth, you keep bringing up global climate change and discussing deeper issues about it. And uh, that, that is going to be very important in the future. Uh, many of the problems, uh, for example, in the US, uh, in our democracy, come about because in elementary school education, people were not taught history correctly. Uh, they were taught what was uh, politically correct history, and so we've got to go back and fix that. I'd like to, to mention uh, one other thing. Uh, for those of you in the audience who are just beginning your career, choose a career that you really enjoy. You get only one life to live, and you ought to enjoy it. And uh, with that, uh, I've, I've talked about the sophisticated mathematics uh, that is required to process big data and AI. I also talked about the approach China is taking uh, to improve university education to produce the talent needed. And so this, this concludes my talk on the mathematical sophistication of the big data revolution. And thank you. Uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk about big data and the need to improve education to produce the necessary talent. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hopcroft, for this uh, interesting talk. It's, it's rich in information. So we learned a lot, and uh, you talked uh, from algorithm and uh, the computer science education to AI, uh, future research direction, and the social impact. There's a lot of issues involved, and it's truly, this is rich in intellectual. And now the questions. Um, we give priority to the questions in this room. Any? Yeah, uh, Xun Li. Uh, Professor Hopcroft, it's uh, really uh, enlightening to listen to your talk. I'm an experimental physicist. Now I learned that uh, data science is not just about crunching computers. It's about how you can design the algorithm to quickly derive uh, your observation. I actually have a real uh, problem. It's actually a problem, a question from my student. I'm an experimentalist. I use synchrotron to collect data and chess um, you know, actually, I'm a, a user at a chess at a Cornell. So now the uh, experiment techniques have been so fast, you can actually collect data very fast. Sometimes you, you may be oversampling. So the question becomes, when my student came back, uh, she has tons of data. The question becomes, do we need to analyze all of these data, or do we need to just analyze a subset of the data and the uh, observation will be uh, sufficiently accurate. Uh, so that, that I, I don't really know how to uh, answer her question. So right now, I just ask her to analyze all of the data. <laughs> well, the, the data is becoming too big to analyze all of it. Right. Uh, so she's, she's going to have to do sampling. And the question is, is how do you do the sampling in such a way uh, that with high probability, the 
the results you get will be close to what the real results should be. Uh, and uh, one of the things, this, this is really going to be the important part of education, is how, how to handle the amount of data that, that people are, are, are getting. Let, let me also comment one thing about computer science. Uh, dear, during my career, we were focused on making computers useful. So we were interested in compilers, operating systems, algorithms, databases, and things like that. But today, computers have become useful. And so computer science is changing in a fundamental way. Uh, we're now starting to ask, uh, what are the computers being used for? And we're looking at applications. And so um, faculty now are teaming up with people in application areas. Uh, so there are computer scientists working with physicists, with, with agricultural people in agriculture, with people in chemistry, in, in all kinds of applications. Uh, so the future of computer science, a big piece of it, is, is applications. So she might be able to build a team, which includes some physicists, but also an uh, a, a computer scientist who understands uh, randomness and sampling of big data. Thank you. Good. Uh, any? Okay. Uh, yeah, we. Joe, you. Uh, thank you, John, for a very nice uh, talk and covering uh, self, uh, several topics. Uh, this is really very interesting to us because uh, we're educators and we face, uh, you know, the research problems as well as the students. But we also have the interest in seeing how this AI and, and data science technologies uh, work in the real world. And you alluded to one of the issues uh, on uh, autonomous driving. I, I would like to use that as an example to see how difficult this thing can be uh, if we put things into auton autonomous. Uh, you know, uh, in the last week or so, uh, China, uh, the Baidu uh, company, Baidu, has released a piece of news. They said they have uh, uh, put together a prototype uh, autonomous car without a steering wheel. Okay, without a steering wheel. So, so then the idea is that you really don't need a steering wheel. Uh, so I'm not going to mention what if the car breaks down, how are you going to sort of push it uh, to your garage? If you do have a steering wheel, you can do that. Without, I'm not going to talk about this. I'm going to say, uh, you know, if you have a fully autonomous car driving in a real uh, city street, I think the difficulty here is the real-time uncertainty. Uh, that's innumerable. I think you mentioned a great example of this uh, 10 to the 100 power of uh, vertices, but that's still, innumer that's still innumerable. Uh, okay, so I think real-time uncertainty is the other way. Do, do you think these autonomous systems will be 100% foolproof? Is there any way to make it? 100% foolproof. Uh, no, they're not going to be 100%, but they may be better than a human driver. Uh, and, and it's not clear uh, how these vehicles are eventually going to be designed. Uh, right now, we have vehicles which are partially autonomous. And the other day, I was going along, and uh, I was on a street where I had the right of way but there was a street that merged in at a 45 degree angle and it had a stop sign. But my car looked at that stop sign and thought the stop sign was for me. <laughs> a, a human would have realized it was for the other road and so we came to a stop. Uh, and uh, I noticed that there are large numbers of things that happen in these vehicles which are partially autonomous. Uh, so we have quite a ways to go before uh, we get a, a car that you could, really could be fully autonomous. And one of, one of the things they might do uh, is make the car interact with the road. 
In, in other words, instead of using vision to track the road, maybe the road will communicate with the car and tell it how to go. Uh, and that's how street sign uh, speed limits now in, in the U.S. Uh, they, they still have signs up, so people with, uh, who aren't in the digital age know what the speed limit is. Uh, but you also get the speed limit digitally. Uh, and by digitally connecting you to the road, you don't have to look for stop signs, you don't have to look for traffic lights and things like that. It would make the problem much easier. Uh, but it, it's, I think it still has a long way to go till they're uh, fully autonomous. And, and by the way, I mentioned when I was talking that there are legal issues. Uh, if your self-driving car gets in an accident, who's responsible? You know, is it the owner of the car, or the designer of the car, or the manufacturer of the car? So we're going to have to change our legal systems. We're going to have to, there's a lot of things that are going to have to be done. Um, but it, eventually it's going to come. And by the way, driving into your garage without a steering wheel is probably simple. <laughs> the car can probably already do that. Good. Yeah, uh, there are a lot of online questions. Okay, I pick one. Uh, John, the question is, what is the bottleneck of big data in our big data era? What is a bottleneck? Oh, well, I, it's, it's simply the size. Uh, because as I mentioned, uh, the, the amount of data that you're, well, you can accumulate uh, so much data in just a second that you can't handle it. Uh, it's like the physicist was, was concerned with the amount of data. Uh, but when you look at, at these particle accelerators and so forth, uh, it's, it's simply the quantity. Um, how, how are you going to handle that? Okay. Um, another question. Uh, some people think that uh, reinforce the reinforcement learning, that's reinforced learning, will be an appropriate way for a self-driving car. So what do you think about it? Yeah, I, I don't know enough about uh, self-driving cars. I know a number of companies claim that they're soon going to have cars which really are truly automatic. Uh, but I think they still have quite a ways to go. And in, in fact, I, I suspect that it's going to be a different technology than maybe they're actually developing now. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah I have a curious question. Yeah. When you talk about nowadays when university hiring those researchers, for faculty, and uh, basically you regard the university as the, the place. The main purpose of a university is to educate the new scientists, those, the next generation of talents. But uh, when we hire those researchers for faculty, so the criteria is always to look at the candidates what is their research output? But instead of looking at their research output, as you said, their curiosity, their continuous learning and update the, the, the teaching material will be more important. But how to set this kind of criteria? Do you have any idea or any suggestion to come up with the, a new set of criteria for hiring those new faculty members. Yes, yeah, so one thing you might look at is has the faculty member changed the, the topics that he works on? Uh, if he's working Good. on two or three topics, uh, that suggests that he's curious and that he's not just stuck on one thing. Uh, another is to ask him, why did you pick the topic that you're working on? Um, because that's more important than uh, actually the topic. And I should mention something about research. Um, there are two types. One is called applied research, 
and the other is called basic research. And the difference it has nothing to do with how important it is or how fundamental. Uh, the difference has to do with why you're doing it. Uh, why research you're doing uh, because there's a specific problem you want solved. Basic research you're doing simply because you're curious about something and there may not be any application at all. Uh, in fact, uh, basic research could be if you gave a lecture and the students didn't seem to learn, understand it very well, basic research would be to explore, well, how can I give that lecture better? Uh, and in the United States, uh, universities simply do basic research. Cornell will not allow me to accept a grant to do applied research. Um, if there are deliverables, the university will prohibit it. Uh, so it has to be what I'm curious in, which I can publish wherever I want to publish, and so on. Now, you might say, why does our National Science Foundation simply uh, uh, fund basic research? They will not fund applied research. And the answer is, they're not interested in the specific research that you propose. And in fact, if you get a research grant, you don't have to do the research you propose. Uh, if you become curious about something else, you do that. Because they're not funding you because of the actual research. They're funding you uh, because uh, you're going to teach students. And it turns out that even though basic research has no application, it's uh, had a tremendous impact on our economy. Uh, when you're doing a, applied research, you're working on a narrow area, and you're not going to leave that area. But when you're doing basic research, you're going off in all kinds of directions. Most of it doesn't lead to anything. But occasionally, somebody is exploring something that's crazy, and all of a sudden, they find a whole new discipline which creates an entire new industry and millions of jobs. And it's that rare occasion which, which actually funds, uh, it really says you should fund basic research. Uh, now, there's a difference between research in the US, uh, between education in the US and education in China. Uh, the mission of a university in the US is to produce the next generation of talent. Uh, and we don't do applied research because there are enough scientists and engineers already educated that if the, the country wants some problem solved for a company, uh, they'll simply hire somebody either in a national lab or the com company will hire somebody and they will do the research in a timely manner. But in China, they have not yet produced enough scientists and engineers for the needs of the nation. And so universities in China have a dual mission. One is to produce the next generation of talent. The other is uh, to help the government and companies with applied research. But the one issue that's critical there is to make sure that the second mission to do applied research doesn't hurt the mission uh, to educate the next generation of talent. And, and one other thing I should say about education, uh, we're not uh, simply educating people to get a good job. What we're really doing is educating them to have a good life. And it's not how much money somebody earns uh, that's going to contribute to the quality. Uh, it's, it's whether they really learn what it is they enjoy in life and what they want to do, and whether they develop a career that way. And one of the important parts of education is helping students understand what they really enjoy doing and giving them the background to be successful there. Wow, John, this is a very incredible point. And uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, that uh, the, the NSF will find the fundamental research, the purpose is actually to enhance the teaching. And uh, you also understand very well about uh, the education policy in China. They have the dual mission. And uh, the most important point that you just uh, mentioned, that's really great. 
the university education is not only to help graduates find a job, it's to help them to have a wonderful, happy life. That's a great, yeah, that's a very great point. Now let's come to the, another question. The one question that I guess let's ask it by a student. What is your suggestion for anyone who want to start their research in AI? Do you have a suggestion for them? Yeah, so um, it, it comes back to asking them, is there anything in AI they're curious about? Uh, or is there part of AI that they really enjoy? Uh, and they shouldn't, uh, so let me tell you, I've, I've talked to many Nobel Prize winners, and I've asked them, uh, what was their strategy that made them so successful? And not one of them said they had a strategy. Every one of them said, when something came along, I simply asked, would I enjoy that? And if so, I explored it. If I wouldn't, I just ignored it. So I guess I would tell the, the student uh, they should look at opportunities as to what they could approach. And if something looks exciting, they ought to spend some time exploring it. And if they still find it exciting, they should stick with it. But if they're not, they should change their topic. And students who work for me, who got their PhD under my guidance, I never told them what to work on. I, I told them to just do what they want to do. And many of them changed the topic during, during their time. But a number of them have been quite successful. Uh, I think I have five of my students who are members of our National Academy of Science. Uh, and one of them got a, a Turing Award. Um, so I, I would just tell the students, uh, just explore and spend your time on what you find exciting. Good, 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 great. Yeah, great answer. Uh, to find uh, what you are curious about it and uh, follow your, your, your curiosity. Uh, due to the time limit, we are only allowed to have one last question. Any body on this floor would like to ask the last question? Okay. The question from the online uh, audience. That's uh, you were talking about the probability-based methods. What are the other techniques do you think that can be applied to the subset sampling on large-scale data set? For example, the Yelp or Amazon COPS. COPS. So what are the other techniques you can think about well, it, it turns out that um, statistics has become a large part of computer science. Uh, the, other, the other area is part of applied math and optimization. But, and, and by the way, I, I talk just about the part of computer science having to do with big data and AI. Uh, there are these other parts having to do uh, with operating systems, with networks, with security. Uh, privacy and, and those things. Um, and there's also the whole area of, of quantum computing. Um, and so computer science is, is much broader. But the, the, the big part, the biggest piece of it is really in applications in other areas. Good, good. Uh, I guess, okay, Joe, I give you the, okay, that's the last question. John, I think maybe others are also curious, as I am, about the current status of your project 101 with Peking University and maybe the Ministry of Education in China. So what's the current status of your project 101? I think it's very important that for teachers to understand how to make students learn instead of just teaching the same material every year. Yes, uh, by, by the way, I think the project is going quite well. Uh, it started in December of 2021. 
and uh, in a meeting with the Minister of Education, uh, he asked the president of PKU to come with me to the meeting, and he designated the president of PKU to handle this project. Uh, and there are now about 400 faculty working on it. Um, and uh, I had hoped to go back in April uh, to be involved myself, but uh, Shanghai government asked me to delay uh, because, because of the virus. Uh, and so in uh, three weeks, I'll be headed over to China uh, uh, to get back involved. But I, I've stayed involved uh, in Zoom meetings. But one of the difficulties is in having faculty sit in on a lecture. If it's at a different university, uh, this in the, the spring, they had trouble getting onto the university. Uh, the universities had uh, uh, issues. Uh, so what they did is they tried uh, video uh, uh, value, interacting with the class through video and, and uh, it was difficult. difficult. Uh, but in September, I, I think that part will get off well. Um, and the Minister of Education asked to have the material available by July. This is July, it's supposed to happen now. Uh, I, I talked with them by Zoom uh, last night, uh, and it's, it's going to be September before they have all the material ready. But one of the ways, by the way, they're creating the material is they're not going to create books. I mean, a lot of faculty are going to write books, and there's no problem with that. But the way the material is going to be, they're going to take a, a course, and they ask, create 50 to 100 topics which are important to this course. And then each topic, they will write material which will just be three or four pages. And the reason for doing it that way, uh, it's, it's not a, a curriculum, it's just content. And different universities, there are 1,500 universities who are going to be using this material in the fall. Different universities are going to teach the course differently, and different faculty are going to want to use different material. So the material will simply be there that a faculty member can look at and uh, select what they want to use and ignore the rest. But also, they're going to get thousands of comments that this, this particular document isn't well written and so forth. If it was in book form, it would take months to re-edit, to rewrite the book. But this, all they'll have to do is go into that topic. It'll be three or four pages, and it'll only take a day or two to fix. Uh, so I think it's I think it's in good shape, uh, but I, I will know better. Uh, the, the, probably the person to contact uh, is the dean of computer science at PKU, uh, uh, who A H U. Uh, he, he he could probably tell you better. Uh, I I will have a Zoom call with them in another couple of days to get. Uh, more data, but uh, I think it's going very well. Thank you. Okay, John, uh, thank you very much to, for giving us such uh, information rich and uh, inspiring talk. And when this pandemic is over, you are most welcome to visit the City University of Hong Kong in person. Hopefully we can meet you. We can see you. Yeah, uh, let's uh, to, yeah, please join us to thank <laughs> Professor Hopcock for giving us a talk. Thank you very much, John. Bye-bye.